All right, before I work on this down, we'll warm the place up a little bit. So right now it's 60 and a quarter, 61 and a quarter degrees. Or is that two? That's 62 and a half degrees. To get heat in here, I run my air compressor and the after cooler up there, basically the big radiator that cools the air down. So right now we're about 153 PSI right now. It goes up to 178. Yeah. Might be a little bit high in the shop. It looks like my tribodine oil is leaking. It leaks out of that plug for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, right now this is an after cooler, so basically it's a big radiator. If you look up in there, there's a radiator going on up in there. And the hot air has run for a little while, so it's, it's nice and warm right now. So you go through your single stage pump here goes into a two-stage over here so you got big cylinder and small cylinder raise your pressure up you compress it twice which makes it really really hot this is your stock after cooler for your air compressors and this goes from stage one here to stage two over there so it makes a loop and then it comes out of here and this goes into your tank here so what we did is we stopped right here <clears throat> and we go into the big after cooler up here and then it goes up in the top up there, comes down the other side over here. So better view now. I can get up in here. There you go. Whoa! Don't hit that button. Oops! That was the wrong button. So yeah, that's a high pressure radiator. Is all that is. And it's got a big fan on it that cools off the, the flow. You can see all the veins up in there and thinning up in there. So it's got 1,800 hours on it already. <clears throat> Got 3,100 hours on the air compressor. Of course, that's the second motor and the second, second pump, second motor. <laughs> so this was a five-horse speed air compressor, <clears throat> bought in '77, and uh, so now it has a uh, seven and a half horsepower pump on it. And then when the electric motor gave up the ghost, the five horse motor, I bought a seven and a half horse motor to go with a seven and a half horse pump. So we run that. So it's been hot rotted basically. <coughs> Excuse me. Basically we took the small block out and we put a big block in it. That's what we did. And then on the back, you got the pulleys back there. And on the electric motor back there, there's a big ass pulley back there. Uh. So that pulley there is like an inch bigger in diameter than the one that was on it originally. So we speed the pump up, which makes the pump more pissed off at you. So, and then of course we run the pressure up to 178 PSI for some reason. It used to be 175. When I put the big motor on here, I went from 150 to 175 PSI. What the hell? It's a bigger motor, got more power. That means we can crank it up higher. And we did. So, but now it's up to 178. I don't know why it's, the shutoff valve has been sitting for a lot of years, not being used, so it's higher now than it used to be. So, anyway, that's what we do there. So this is the bead blaster here, which is a big Unihome. That'd be that brand right there. It's made in Los Angeles, and that'd be in California, not somewhere else, not not Lower Alabama. So it has oh 1,900 hours on it. Dad likes hour meters on everything. He probably bought this in 77 too, like everything else he'd seen a in that year. He must have some money that year. So anyway, this is a big ass blaster. So I just got done blasting uh, some plates. What did I do with them? Uh, put them somewhere. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. What did I do with them? Oh, here they are. So these are some uh, wide glide fender brackets. They're going to rust easily blasting. So, I blasted those, and the other day I blasted the, uh, the VL inner primary. Looks like a 45, but bigger. So this is stuff I buy on eBay. So I bought this here on eBay uh, recently. So that's the tag they have on it. So you buy a nice rusty cylinder, like this, and you don't know how good it is until you clean it. So someone cleaned it, and it sat and got rusty. So now we have to re-clean it again. It's not too pitted here in the gasket surfaces, but it's 
when you got real heavy barnacle rust like this, that means it's really, really pitted bad. If you have just laying the surface rust like right here, we kind of just rub it off. That's not really bad. There you go. Put a blast this thing. So, we have a big air now over here. There's a big ass hole in it. Really up in there. There's a big air hole. So, this thing sucks the air completely down if you want to keep it at all. The glass beads are, which I saw that glass. We have sand too. Almost filled up. Stop cutting off out there. There we go. Nice and hot in here. You can feel the heat back here a little bit, but you know, get by the front up here. About here, it starts getting cold because there's a big wall right here. So when you get all the way back to here, temperature the same as it was. See, so it didn't change. The closer you get to that cold-ass door, the colder it gets. All right, so this is what the cylinder looks like after you blast on a little bit. Now, if you go back and look at the hour meter from before, you can see how long it was on here, how long it took to do that, because I didn't pay attention. You have to go back and look yourself. So there is the, the after effects of blasting. Work around here. So let me put this heavy ass true in the way. Who that was? All right. So this is what they said it was. All right. So you can see the difference between blasted and non-blasted. You can see how rust, how deep the rust pitting is in here. Uh, the rust will come out of the pores here when you sit overnight. It'll come back up out of the pores a little bit. But overall, it's about what I suspected it to be. It's still smooth on the surface, so it's not all eaten out real bad. So basically, it just gives the gasket more bite on the surface now. At least that's the excuse we're going to call it. The bore is, uh, you can see the, the lip up in here from the wear lip. But there's no massive scratching, galling, bad wrist pins, or heavy, deep rust. Bore, which is really good because it was definitely rusty. It's got a brake right there, which I already knew about. That brake there is not good. There, right there. Didn't know about that brake. She goes around and stops right there. That's not good. So, yeah, that's this one right here. So, you can run it with that in there, but it's not exactly what you want to see. The advantage is it's on the spot of the cylinder does not wear because that is on the side. Your thrusting is front to back. So this is a front cylinder because the rear cylinder has a big large area here. It goes around. The other way you tell is this is the oil feed hole because it's a panel cylinder. This is the return hole. The feed is on the right. It returns on the left. Feed, return, window of the cylinder is for the V-angle, so that makes this a front because this is the left side, the rear, and the rear would be behind you. So there's lots of ways to tell what cylinder these are. Panhead cylinders are sculptured out like this, so are knuckles. The um, shovel heads are rounded all the way around, so you can tell the cylinders you have by what you got there. That's a sporcer cylinder, they're four bolt. Some people don't know the differences in these things for some reason. This is what happens when you drop in your box too many times, it breaks it. So this now is broken. That's a fresh break and shipping damage. So that's always fun to have. Always like it when you get good parts come in broken. So that got dropped and broke it. So luckily I got the part and it's top fin so you can braise it up and weld it back on. But it's extra expense you're not expecting. Happens a lot on shipping. So. So this is a painted cylinder, 
Now 74 inch cylinders have a bigger bore in them. They're 7 16 instead of uh, 5 16 on the center bore. That'd be 3 inches in front of that. The other way you tell them apart is the 61s are thin like this all the way around, whereas the 74s have more area out here. So the 61s are rounded. They're just real narrow like this. When you stick out a lot more distance here, it's a big twin cylinder. Or 74 inch cylinder, I guess you call it. So anyway, that's how you identify this stuff. Now going by these casting numbers here, they came up with this. <coughs> I bought it because it was a 10 over cylinder, because 30, uh, 7 16 is a 435, I think, or something. 433, something like that. So this is a 10 over cylinder, which means theoretically it might be cleaned at 20, which is pretty good. But it had a couple broken fins I saw, which eh, it's okay, but it had a small bore. This one's broken here too. But what I couldn't tell, because they never show you on the, online, is it actually a 1950 cylinder. They say because of the M60, it's a 1950. M60 front. So, like most of the stuff that you go buy cast numbers, you're full of crap. Here's the real facts. See that drain hole right there? They didn't have that until 1953. So that pretty much means it's not a 1950 cylinder. So if they ever show that online, I can see that hole right there. I know it's definitely 53 later. Because this oil just around the top of the case. On a 53 motor with solid all the way around. Where on a 52 on back, it had a big oil gal that went all around and drained on the back hole. So they didn't have that hole there. This one drains into the in, right on top of the flywheel. The other one drained all the way around the back side of the case and drilled, came behind the rear lifter block and came down the back of the case. So that's how you identify a 52. So if you're going to do a stroker motor on a pan head, if you buy the 52 in earlier cylinder, you don't have that hole. The oil ring does not get into that. You don't have to plug it. So the preferred cylinder for a stroker motor is your early cylinder. Now if you sleeve these things, then obviously the hole goes away. Now at this point here, the cylinder can be sleeved because it's broken down here. Or you can run it because it doesn't really matter too much right there. As long as it's not broken anymore anywhere. If it's got two brakes coming down, it's a problem. Obviously when it's making the curve right there, that's a problem. That makes it weaker. At some point this would fall off. But I think there's enough material there, it probably wouldn't be an issue. So you could probably risk it and run it. So on a customer bike, you would not do this. On a, my bike, I'd run this thing every all day long. I wouldn't give a squat. But that's how I know what works and doesn't work, because I do it myself. But if it breaks on my bike, it doesn't matter. If it breaks on your bike, you care. So like I said, I, if it didn't have that 90 degree turn right there, I'd be happier. I don't like seeing it making the turn. So I'd rather just have it straight down to stop. The cylinder feels pretty round, so it probably would fit inside the case the way it is. This little break here is not going to really hurt you really at all. There's no other cracking going on that I can see. So I would just kind of grind that round so it wouldn't, <coughs> excuse me, so these little pieces here wouldn't break off down the road and leave it. The piston's not going to matter way down here at the very bottom. So, so anyway, there's your... There's your info on cylinders. So this needs to be blasted some more to get the rest of this off. So I think I'll go ahead and do that a little bit. Try to get some heat in the building. I'll be back. Alright, there's the cylinder all done. Uh, it takes too long to finish it. Now the hour meter's at 83 up there now. So let's go back and see how much it's at. So this is supposed to be regulated at 80 pounds. It looks like it's creeped up on there. More noise. 
thing has a leaky regulator up here. Yeah, it shut off when I did that. So this cylinder would have been a nice cylinder if it didn't have that other brake in it. Like I said, these three fins right here are not super major. They're in the middle of the V. And it's behind the air cleaner. The air cleaner sits right here, so you wouldn't hardly even notice them on the bike at all. So it's been a really nice cylinder to use for my bike, but this side's all good. Except, like I said, it's got that big brake right there, which is not good. So, anyway. But I can still use it if I wanted to, which I might. I don't know. Let's see what else I find. My 57 drag bike pan and motor has a shovel top on it right now, so I'm always looking for parts. So, but like I said, this tag is wrong because it's not a 50. It's going to be, it might be a 1960 casting. It's definitely not 50. 60 I would go for, 50, no way. So like I said, you can't go by these casting numbers. Everybody says they know how to read this stuff. Obviously, that ain't true. But this is no way this is a 1950 cylinder because the oil hole is in there. So once again, right down there, is an oil hole. All right. So that's how the blaster works. Like I said, I regulate it down to about 80 pounds. Looks like it runs about 70 when it's running. So I'll have to go in here and crank this thing up a little bit, maybe. I don't know. I said the regulator's been acting up. It's I haven't been using this blaster for quite a bit lately. So pretty much been out of the hair for a lot of years. So getting the parts working again. Everything is a little different from sitting. Like I said, I got a lot of air volume in there. Got 80 gallons there, 80 here for 160. <clears throat> Dad kept boring the tip needle nozzle out on this thing until it started cutting cutting real good. So that hole that's way down in there, way down deep in there, that hole right there, you can see how it gets worn away also. That's where the air comes out. That's this airline right here. This is the flow where the beads come in through here on the side. It's a suction deal. It sucks up from the bottom through this hose right here. That goes down oh, into the hopper down there, which gets holes in it, so that's why it's all taped up under there. So it goes through that hole right there. <clears throat> this is a separator, it separates the bad from the good. It's a pretty expensive blaster. So the whole back here's got shakers in here that that separate the bad from the good. That's why you get the shaker. So oh, it helps out the air valve on me. Turn the shaker on. Get that in there. Hear it shaking. Doesn't shake very good under 120 pounds, and we're only at like 100 and something pounds. So it doesn't really work too good. When you only got 110, it takes like 120 to make it start shaking good. So then it goes like that when it does. It's big bellows bags and it's shaking there. So when that separates the bad from the good. So when you open up the nozzle on this thing, the air ball nozzle, you get a lot more air volume coming out of here. It puts a lot harder to draw on the beads. You got a lot more volume of beads coming out. So instead of blasting a little small little hair, you got an area like that and you're blasting. It does a lot better job of cleaning the parts. But it sucks a lot of air. And it sucks a lot of air. <coughs> Excuse me. So it burns through the air pretty heavily. So that's why this air compressor is too small, even though it's been hot rod and it's bigger. I need my 10 horse air compressor like I have the other place, which is why I got that big phase converter back there. So eventually we'll get the, we'll use that phase converter back there for the big air compressor when I'll put it outside. And then we'll have 15 horsepower of air going. You have this one and the other one outside, which would be 15 horsepower worth. So anyway, that's how it works. So that's how you clean parts. That's how I do it. And after you get to this point, you gotta put something on it to re-rust. So put a little spray on it. WD-40. I use my CRC. You can also go paint it right now if you wanted to and bake it on. It'll be nice and good. I use the CRC here. Is what I use for the rust preservative. It'll sit for a few years like that and not re-rust like this stuff here. When you got raw steel, it just rust everywhere. So you gotta keep it clean. So, oh well, so there you go. Keep the auction off it, it won't rust. Put auction to it, it will rust. So, so I, there's the cylinder. So that's a start on another one. All right, that's it for this one. I forgot to talk about something. Uh, 
key thing is air in your in your um, you get condensation in your air when you compress it. The air ox the um, humidity in the air will condense and collect in your tank and have lots and lots of water issues, especially getting your airlines, all your tools and stuff you blow off gets full of air, full full of water. So you gotta keep the water out of stuff. So they make these water separators like this that really don't do much. They cost a lot, but they don't do much. Anything in there? Probably not. So there's water separators under here that I've never ever seen you ever take water out of the line. <laughs> the best water separator we got is right here. When you go through the condenser and you cool the air back down, the water drops out of suspension, goes in the bottom of the tank here. This valve here goes down. Probably about to here, I would imagine. And this one just picks up right here. And so the air turbulates in here. The uh, water drops out. And then when you go back in here, not a lot of it goes into here. Most of it goes here. You'll have heat here. This gets hot. If you have this thing on, it won't, it'll stay relatively cool. Your tank doesn't get really hot. If, it, if your hand's getting hot, you put a lot of hot air into it. So we've run this for a little while. Let's see how much air or water we've got out of it. Out like this. You don't have too much come out. It makes a big mess. It's common to fill this thing up a couple times. It's completely full of water. So right now I've gotten this much water out of it. So that's probably a pint of butter there. That's probably from the 70s, that bowl. <laughs> At least the 80s. So the uh, so just a short time of run down, we got a pint of a uh, pint of water out of our air, just from uh, filling this up twice. Now we fill up once, turn the air compressor on, ran it through one cycle. Now we sucked it down again, so it's been filled twice. So that's a uh, 240 uh, gallons of compressed air, plus whatever it was doing while it was running. So you might have 300, 350 gallons of air, and we've already got that much water out of it. So there's a lot of humidity in the, in the air. So if you didn't get that out of there, you'd go in the bottom of that tank and settle in there. And, and if it never cooled off, it'd go into all your airlines and make a big mess. So that's the best way of getting the water out of your system is right there. That works really, really well. The only thing better than that is to run two of them. And that would probably do even more because there's still some gets in here. Not a lot. I drained it out here and it, uh, this bucket right here, I filled it up one and a uh, Oh, when I fill that thing up. I think I filled about one and a quarter. And I don't know how long it's been running. So, off and on over a few years. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the difference there. So, alright, that's it for uh, this one. Back to making noise and getting my tank filled up so I can go do something. There you go.